Well, hi everybody. It's just great to be back here, ready for another fireside chat in my den, looking out on the beauty of the brand new leaves that are springing out slowly on the trees. I'm having pretty good cover here off my balcony right now in sunny Southern California, and I'm looking at my beautiful poinsettia, which has lasted so magnificently since Christmas, and it makes me feel good. I call her flamingo. And, of course, I talk to my plants, and I'm absolutely convinced that they love it. And I tell them how much I love them. And that's true with my calanchos. In fact, I'm looking at one out in the balcony, which is rugged, and tough, and ready, and can take the cattle all summer. And it was the first plant I ever bought when I came here almost two years ago now. And uh, just about uh, three weeks ago, it decided <laughs> in one of our uh, rare windy days to uh, take a dive off the balcony and crash two stories down into the bushes. So I went down, retrieved, and rescued my lady from her ignominious fall, and uh, she had lost quite a few branches, but thank God it's doing beautifully, and it has blossomed sitting out there blessing me again today. As I certainly hope to bless you, and I thank God for the blessing that you've been to me. So another fireside chat that so many of you seem to like so much and write to me about. And in the words of Michael Buffer at the great championship uh, fights, let's get ready to rumble. And I think I'm finally ready. It has been a long and kind of weird beginning to the new millennium and new year with many, many wonderful things and also some very intense spiritual warfare, which I now feel is definitely, and I won't say I, I feel, I do feel it, but I know is coming to an end for myself and the entire extended family. So take heart, hang on. Uh, in fact, I'll read you a card that God gave me the other day that I hope will richly bless you. I may, may even send copies of it to a few of you when I get a chance. But this has been one of those periods when I've been locked up in God's bottle. And uh, he wouldn't let me out, wouldn't let me do the tapes or anything, but simply work through in the darkness of the alchemical retort in the fires. And you know that that's my calling. And while I holler and yell and cuss and swear and throw tantrums and everything else, you finally get out when God's ready to let you out. And uh, this is Aurora. This is the time of the dawning without a question. I'll be saying a whole lot more about that. But Marie von Franz, who's one of my very favorite Jungian authors in a favorite old book, Alchemy, uh, had this to say about the thing that I've experienced and the delay in getting this new series underway. On page 266 of that book, even the highest and most important occupation connected with one's own inner development has a narcissistic quality. In other words, narcissism is centering in on yourself. I'll repeat that line. Uh, in other words, you're locked up in a bottle, as I said. Even the highest and most important occupation connected with one's own inner development has a narcissistic quality. It has to be so. Please note that. It has to be so, to be locked up in the bottle once in a while. For a time, one has to be shut up in the vessel. These are von Franz's words. For a time, one has to be shut up in the vessel and attend to one's own business and to some extent not be open towards life during that period. That is necessary and inevitable. I'm going to repeat that without comment from von Franz. Even the highest and most important occupation connected with one's own inner development has a narcissistic quality. It has to be so. For a time, one has to be shut up in the vessel and attend to one's own business, and to some extent not be open towards life during that period. That is necessary and inevitable. And I trust that that will sink in and that you'll find consolation and comfort in it, because I know God will shut you up in the bottle periodically, and don't fight it. I know you will fight it, because I always do, but uh, try to accept it as much as you can. That there's a time to withdraw, and a time to be locked up in yourself, shut up in the vessel, and attend to your own business. And that's what I've been doing for three months, and I'm finally beginning to see cosmos out of chaos. As I practiced what I preached in the last tape of the last series in Grandma's bedroom, and I've been sitting with God counting cars, so to speak. And some things are finally getting under control. And there's some order coming out of the uh, chaos. 
and I'm grateful to God for that. So I've got one, lots of wonderful stuff to share with you, and I'm going to ask Nancy uh, by phone if she'd like to have me save some space on here so that she can share some things with you about our brand new website that she and Ryan have done such a fantastic job on. I mean, I am very proud of that. Now, you different ones have asked me, do I receive email? No, not directly. I get it as I do so much of the mail indirectly through the Cody office, through Nancy. I do not have a computer, a word processor, or anything like it. And very honestly, right now, I don't feel like God wants me to have one. I'm open to it if he ever wants to educate me in it. But those are not my my uh, uh, gifts at all, as you know. And so you will not send email directly to me. Uh, even though we have an email address, it will go to Nancy and get passed on to me. And she's very faithful and efficient about passing on the mail, and handling the mail, and the finances and the messages and so on and i deeply appreciate the excellent job that she's done and i also want you to sit up and take notice because i'm very proud of my younger son ryan he's the guy who's really the engineer on the website he's uh really doing great uh i am i'm very very proud of him you know he's in high school now and and uh, he does this uh, uh in his quote unquote spare time besides playing the drums at church and, uh, and other events, and is doing well. In fact, he just bought himself his first car, though he can't drive it right away quick. It'll, he'll have to wait, I think, for his birthday. But he's really doing well, and I want to say a hearty thank you to him, give him a big hug over the tape, as I've done over the phone, uh, for the excellent work that he's done. So I thank Nancy and Ryan for this uh, marvelous new website, and uh, I'm going to ask Nancy... If she'd like to uh, uh, say a few words at the end of this tape, I'm sure she's got some information for you on the new website and some mechanical things and some words about the future. And I'll, I'll give her a call and see if she'd like to talk to you on this tape. I just did a quickie, uh, fresh call to Nancy and Cody, and uh, I will be saving her some space at the end of this thing. I'll have to watch my waxing long winded, I suppose, but uh, she would like to definitely share some things with you and especially some info on the uh, new website. So uh, I trust you'll be listening for that. Now, I want to say right at the outset here, there are a couple of people that I want to especially thanks. thank. And uh, first and foremost, I want to dedicate this tape to my friend of a long standing, very long standing when I think about it. Uh, and think of the first memory I have of her dancing in front of a huge crowd in, uh, I don't know whether it was in Philadelphia, in the big convention center, or wherever, someplace where I was with Mo Wayne Mondlo. So it's been a good many years, uh, like 15, 20, I don't know how long. And I'm not trying to date my dear friend Kathy Kowalski, but when I was on my last trip, I think it was at John and Donna Scalzo's meeting, in Dunellen, New Jersey, she gave me a gift certificate to get a brand new tape recorder at Radio Shack. And what you're listening to is uh, being done on that new machine, so it's appropriate that I take my very dear friend Kathy here and say uh, this is especially for you. And thank you so much for the uh, Radio Shack gift and uh, uh, for this high-quality machine that you can actually see through the... Uh, you know, into the tape uh, where the tape is turning on the deck. It's called an optimist, and uh, this is the very first tape being done on a new CTR 109 cassette recorder. And uh, Kathy's gift made that possible, and I'm double recording on the old machine as well, which will be going to Nancy for use in the Cody office. So uh, thank you, Kathy, not only for this new machine, but also for uh, the excellent books that you have in very timely fashion handed to me over the years uh, under the guidance of the Spirit of God that have been exactly the right book at the right time. Which leads me to say that the bibliography will be forthcoming about the time of the second tape in this series, which will be in the very near future. And it is going to be a crackerjack of a bibliography. And I'm not going to make it extremely long, but I'm going to put some top choice quality books on it and i hope you'll read the stuff i put with it because uh i want to save you some money if i can and uh give you some suggestions 
and uh, show you how to pick the right books by the grace of God. So that bibliography will be forthcoming too, but I thought of that because of the many times Kathy has handed me with perfect timeliness the most excellent uh, of books time and time again, and of course you've heard me say that. Now I'm not going to, as I thought I would, take time to read any uh, recent mail. Uh, wonderful special letters. I deeply appreciate your love letters and your correspondence and your fascinating notes and the rest of it. Thank you so much for continuing to communicate with such warmth and love. It means so very, very much to me. I can't tell you thank you enough for your kind and loving communications, telephone calls as well. And God bless you. And uh, remember, uh, just uh, keep writing uh, Post Office Box 3160, Cody, Wyoming, Zip 82414. And it's time for us to pick up some new donors in this ministry. You know, as you go over uh, the years, you're bound to lose some from time to time. And we have lost some. And it's time, if you want to see this ministry sustained, for you to get into the habit of regular giving and to express your appreciation. Because if I give to you spiritual things, it's, as the Apostle Paul said, not a great thing to expect you to give back of your temporal things. That's the way it is in the New Testament. And uh, I hope that you'll uh, get on the ball and remember your giving and not be forgetful. Put a rubber band on your finger or something, but remember we do need your faithful and loving support, and I thank God for each one of you who are so faithful in your giving, but we do need to pick up some new donors. So be praying about it, talk with the Spirit about it, and then respond to His entreaty and His command. Uh, remember, it takes money to wage war, and I'm waging war. Believe me, big-time war, and I do need support to do that, At uh, particularly at 70 years of age. Uh, you know, a lot of guys are retired at this age, and I'm glad I'm still going strong and feeling good. So keep praying for me. I'm enjoying good health, and uh, I'm just delighted to be sitting back here uh, with a fireside chat. But I've got so much to tell you, I don't want to read letters this time. We'll postpone that until another time, and I know it'll be a great blessing to you then. Okay, we're ready to rumble. Let's bow together in prayer and invite the Savior to bless us together. Dear Heavenly Father, it is a real joy to be have the genie out of the bottle, so to speak, as I said earlier, and be back here with my friends in my den, I feel their presence and their love and their warmth. I feel your presence, your love, and your warmth. And I am very grateful for that after a time of abandonment, which I know after my long years of walking with you is essential to this ministry to which you've called me and to which you've called many of these dear people that I love so much. And now we look for your anointing and your blessing on the first tape of our new series, Melchizedek, Mysticism, and Science. And I believe that you're going to pour out your spirit and the warmth of your love through these tapes, reaching out and multiplying the impact in the family of God at large. In Jesus' name, with great thanksgiving, amen. Now. Uh, the second person that I want to give a special word of appreciation and thanksgiving to is my old friend Walter Hojak, who is a, an engineer from San Francisco, formerly from uh, Princeton, New Jersey, where incidentally he'd like to return someday, so hold Walter up in prayer. But uh, around Christmas time, and I've mentioned this book before, but I'm going to underline it again because it is outstanding. And I wrote on the flyleaf a marvelous synchronistic Christmas gift from the Spirit and Walter, illustrative of my lifelong philosophy, what is mine will come to me. Amen. Now, this is called Synchronicity, and it's written by Joseph Jaworski. And I mentioned this, I think, on the last tape of the last series. Uh, Joseph Jaworski is an internationally famous multinational corporate lawyer who is the son of Leon Jaworski, who was the famed prosecutor at Watergate back in the Nixon era. And uh, this man has a great spirituality and a great love of life to him. And uh, 
This book uh, is particularly uh, good for me to mention right now, Synchronicity, with subtitle, The Inner Path of Leadership, with an excellent introduction by Peter Senge. Do not miss reading the introduction and every word in the book. It is outstanding. And I thank Walter again publicly uh, for his uh, sensitivity of the spirit in sending this book on to me, because this ranks right up there with Margaret Wheatley's uh, leadership in the new science that I ballyhooed so much on earlier tape series. Now, uh, this comes in particularly timely fashion today because when I went to buy my new tape recorder that, uh, with Kathy's uh, Radio Shack gift, there was a young Hispanic fellow and a gringo in there, two young fellows, and uh, we got into a great conversation. And they wanted to know what I did. And when I mentioned that I uh, lectured on the new science and spirituality, they were vitally interested immediately and asked what they might read. And I, this is the book I recommended. And when I went back a second time just the other day to get some needful, uh, maybe you can hear my bird clock singing in the background. I don't know. But in any case, when I went back to get uh, uh, a special battery the other day, the young uh, Hispanic fellow had just been entranced with this. He'd gone to Barnes & Noble, as I suggested, and gotten into this book. And uh, I'm going to give you a couple lines from Peter Senge's introduction, which is absolutely excellent. Don't uh, skip over introductions. They're there for a purpose. And when you get a man as able in his writing as Peter Senge, and with the kind of spirit that he has, you don't want to miss what he's got to say. So don't skip over the introductions. This comes from the introduction on page uh, 12. I'm quoting from uh, Sangi and uh, Synchronicity, The Inner Path to Leadership. Uh, Robert Frost said that home is the place you shouldn't have to earn. You know, that's a wonderful line right there. I want to feel at home with God. I want to feel at home with God. It's the place where you don't have to put on pretenses and wear facades, in which you can take off your shoes and put on your slippers and sit in your jammies or whatever you want to do. And be exactly who you are. As I sat right here in my den last night, enjoying an excellent cigar with a glass of wine. Uh, getting myself wound down from a very hectic day. So home is the place you shouldn't have to earn. And skipping down that page a little bit. This takes you back to my last tape in the last series. Uh, Grandma's Bedroom, Sitting with Grandma. And he says this, Sengi's words are, When we operate in the state of mind in which we realize that we are part of the unfolding, we can't not be committed. Now, what he's saying there is that if you realize you're part of an unfolding, implicate order, a secret, invisible order. You know what it says in 2 Corinthians 4.16, but we have this treasure in an earthen vessel. Uh, but I have to quote the first part of that. God who shined out of darkness hath shined where? Not in the Bible, not in the church, not in the steepled building, not in the assembly hall. God who shined out of darkness has shined into our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. That's the cosmic Christ. And then it says, uh, this is Second Corinthians 4, we're troubled on every side, yet not distressed, and so on. But in Second Corinthians 4, I think it's the sixth verse, it says, God has uh, shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God. Notice that it is in your heart that this takes place. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are only for time and space, a very temporary order, three dimensions. But the things which are not seen, the fourth dimension and beyond, as Pastor Joe wrote so beautifully about, and I've mentioned in previous series, they are the eternal. While we look not at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen, you have eyes and ears and sensors in your heart to touch the invisible, as Norman Grubb wrote, to live in the invisible dimension, to live in the implicate orders David Bohm, the famous physicist, so beautifully taught us, Einstein's friend and protege. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. In other words, use your heart. Time and again, the Spirit of God will say to me, follow your heart. God's taken out the old wicked heart 
and he's given you a brand new heart, as Ezekiel prophesied in chapter 36. Now trust that heart. Get in touch with your deepest being. And that's what Sengi's really writing about. And then you'll find yourself at home, and you'll turn on your heart light, as I did in a, seri uh, a tape in last year's series. On with Sengi's words here from page 12. When we operate in a state of mind in which we realize that we're part of the unfolding, you know, those wonderful hidden patterns from the quantum waves of spirit, I pray to God that I may have the sensitivity to live in even uh, obedience to the ripples of the patterning. It's one of my favorite prayers. Oh, God, give me the grace to live in obedience to even the ripples of the patterning from that wonderful ocean of love that comes out of the implicate order from the heart of God. There are hidden patterns there. That's why I always mention stereograms. You take a look at them, they look like chaos. You stare at them a while, and the more restful and peaceful you get and try to look through, remember those wonderful words that God gave me in heaven itself, look through. The more you look through, all of a sudden, the quiff pops, as Fred Allen Wolf would say, and you see a pattern. This is the way, as God promised in Isaiah 30, verse 21, your ears will hear a word behind you saying, this is the way, walk ye in it, when you turn to the right hand and when you turn to the left. And Isaiah wrote that, but Paul wrote in Galatians 5, I think it's verse 16, if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. And we are living in the Spirit. Now practice picking up those wonderful sound waves that come, those wonderful light waves that come out of the heart of God in your receptor, in your heart, God who shines out of darkness shines into your heart to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Now I'm going to actually try and read this without my getting to preaching. When we operate in a state of mind in which we realize we are part of the unfolding, we cannot not be committed. It's actually impossible not to be committed. In other words, your heart is at one with God. Nothing ever happens by accident, Peter Senge says. Every single thing is part of what needs to happen right now. And I wrote in the margin that my old friend George Mundell was right when he said, all things are of God, all things are for our sakes, all things work together for good. 2 Corinthians 4.15, 5.18, and Romans 8.28. My old spiritual mentor from back in the mid-50s. Every single thing is part of what needs to happen right now. We only make mistakes that we have to make to learn that we're here to learn right now. Hear that again. How many times have I told you not to worry about making mistakes? Sengi says we only make the mistakes that we have to make to learn what we're here to learn right now. This is a commitment of being, not a commitment of doing. We discover that our being is inherently in a state of commitment as part of the unfolding process. In other words, you can relax and enter into God's rest. He continues, The only way to be uncommitted is to lose that realization and to fall again in the illusion that we aren't participating in life. To start thinking we're abandoned, separated, lonely, isolated individuals that we're not connected with the eternal God. And you know, everything in the genius of the New Testament, in the glory of Pauline theology, God's very special person, the Apostle Paul, as he hath raised us up together, Ephesians 2, 6, and 7, and made us sit together. We're sitting, resting in heavenly places in Christ. I'm not just out here separated by 3,000 miles from you, my friends in New Jersey and New York and uh, Pennsylvania and the Northeast, New England. No, we're one. In the next dimensions, we are one. And we're seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That's why Paul beautifully says in the Williams translation, Colossians chapter 3, practice, 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 occupy your minds with things above. That's fourth dimensional. Practice occupying your things with mind, uh, with uh, uh, practice occupying your mind with things above, not with things on the earth. You've already died, and your life is already hid with Christ in God. Imagine being locked up in that vessel. And that's where we are. Oneness, not separateness. As in three dimensions, everything is isolation and separatism. In the next dimension, 
as we invert things, Nancy's great 1988 dream, and we start living upstairs and hearing from God, separating and sorting things out. We're practicing setting our minds on things above and thinking things that are true and honest and just and pure and lovely and of good report. Our whole world changes in its complexion, and we find ourselves at home in the bosom of God. Hallelujah. So practice that, my friend. Practice it. Don't let anything deter you from it. Do it. Take your daily stroll. I'm, I'm back in my groove taking my daily walk. Be sure you take your daily walk. And, and go out and take a long walk. And enjoy uh, strolling with God. In fact, uh, I have to read you a card. I'm going to pause in a minute, go out in my room and uh, get the card so I can read you a card God gave me at Anna's gift shop the other day. Now I have my cards at hand. Excuse me. Now during these past months since Christmas, many times I've been locked up in God's alchemical vessel, in God's retort, God's laboratory, uh, with the Bunsen burners turned up to max underneath in real spiritual warfare, as I told you earlier in this tape. And uh, you, here's why you want to learn to listen to your heart and, and follow the Lord's leading. This is fresh from my treasure trove. I had an absolutely humongous day last uh, Monday. Or let me see. I think it was Monday. Doesn't matter that much, really, but it was a real... Uh, Real difficult day for me. And I am going to check that out just for the fun of it. Yes, it was last Friday, and I'm glad that I checked it. Checked it in my calendar, my diary here. Uh, the days have a way, as you know, of running together. But it was uh, on Friday, March 31, the end of uh, March. March went out like a lion for me. And I got up in the morning, and I noticed some facial rash. Uh which comes, I believe, from a long-term, low-grade infection in uh, my upper uh, gums. And I've had the dentist uh, do a crown right in that area to the tune of over seven to $800 and told him about it several times. And I woke up the other day and the infection was back. It's one that I carried with me clear last fall when I was on itinerary. Now, let me tell you, these are the circumstances of life that you don't like. To have a low-grade infection that long and to have taken penicillin before, I found myself in mad and depressed and in a full head-on battle with evil. And that's the way evil many times manifests in our life, is in our daily circumstances. And I just had an absolute day of railing at God because I had visions of spending many more hours in the dentist chair, an orthodontist chair, and I may have to do that unless uh, this uh, present uh, course of very powerful penicillin clears it up. So I want you to make that please a matter of prayer that the this uh, powerful course of penicillin that my son has given me now will with finality knock that infection out. Now, it doesn't give me pain or anything, but it gave me some fears about sitting in an orthodontist chair for a lengthy period of time to the tune of hundreds and perhaps even into thousands of dollars because you're totally at the mercy of the medical establishment when you get into one of these things. So it was a serious matter, and I just absolutely told God what I thought about him allowing that to happen, and especially to continue this long after I'd been out on a seven-week-long itinerary to his glory, and this is the kind of conversations I have when I'm at home with God. And when you're at home, it doesn't mean that everything's in peace all the while, as you very well know. So I had a real Donnybrook with God, like you wouldn't believe. And uh, it's uh, it's just incredible. Uh, what And there have been many of those. That's what I mean by being put in God's retort in his alchemical vessel and having them turn the heat up on you. There are too many things that have gone backwards instead of uh, forwards and downwards instead of upwards. And so this gave me a start, really upset me. And uh, I, uh, God kept telling me as I just sat down in despair and tears and said, I don't need any more trials. He kept telling me in the strongest possible terms, an increasing crescendo, get up out of your chair here and go over to Starbucks and have yourself a nice cup of decaf or coffee. And uh, I said, I don't want to go out. 
I might lose my choice parking space, although that didn't matter too much here at my uh, complex where I live. But uh, I was arguing with him on any little point. I want you to know how life goes on and what our wrestling matches look like. And he wouldn't quit. I sat trying to watch some television, but I couldn't watch it because he constantly interrupted me by saying, I said, look, it's almost uh, six o'clock and that's before the clock leap forward one hour. And I said, in a half hour, it'll be dark or so here. And uh, he said, nevertheless, get up and go. And he wanted me to go to Starbucks. So I went over to Starbucks and uh, sat down and uh, enjoyed a cigar over there and got my coffee and sat down with my cigar. And I began to look at uh, two packs of, I love my snapshots and my photographs. You know, I will be a mention, mentioning, I think, later on this uh, tape, that magnificent shot of sunrise in Cody, Wyoming on January the 1st, 1998, right after Nancy and I decided that we should split. And it was a very painful time for me, and God got me out of bed and gave me that beautiful sunrise shot over the ponds in Cody. And many of you got copies of that way back then, and uh, don't ask for them now because I'm out of them and I don't know where the negative is. But in any case, I sent it out to many of you at that time. And it was sunrise. A really uh, magnificent sunrise. And I was looking at my snapshots, the fresh ones that I'd just gotten from some of the trips I've had with Vaughn and Lavon and the family that have greatly blessed me, including my birthday trip. Enjoying my cigar and my coffee and the uh, beautiful uh, snapshots, two big packs of them that I picked up at Walmart, and uh, got into a nice conversation with Adam and Chris. He's studying at Bakersfield College uh, in his midlife and found out that he knew a lot about my old friend Jess Lair and R.D. Lang and others. This fellow was, I found out, two-thirds Indian, American Indian, and just made new friends. We shook hands. I showed him some of our, uh, he and Chris, some of my pictures, and we just had a great time. And I, uh, my whole attitude changed by listening to what God was speaking at home in my heart. It turned my day and the beginning of my week uh, upside down, weekend upside down, when, when I heard that. And then God told me after I finished drinking my coffee and talking with Adam and Chris, go over to the uh, Anna's uh, gift shop and card shop. And I said, tonight I'm a little tired. He said, do this, you'll be blessed. So I went over and I picked out some choice cards. And in the middle of my picking out some choice friendship cards to send to special friends on special occasions, the Lord said, there are two cards that I have for you right there. And look at this one. And I picked it up, and I'm going to pass it on to you as a source of blessing. God said to pass it on. This is for you, too. It's great advice for all of us. And he said, this is from my heart to your heart. Imagine having God send you a card right there in Anna's gift shop. Now, this is what it's like to live in intimacy in the unfolding from the implicate order, which I'm presenting to you today. It'll bring the aurora, the dawning to your life. It, uh, it, it'll just bring the aurora consurgence, the rising dawn. I'll have more to say about that in a few minutes. And this card that God told me is from his heart to mine that he told me to pick up and which I now have posted right out by my easy chair in the living room where I can read it frequently. Here's what it says. And let me see if I can give tribute to whoever uh, was God's uh, source in doing this. No, not uh, right off quick on this one. The other one, I think I can. Ways to take care of your soul. Now, you've heard of chicken soup for the soul, and there's nothing of chicken soup in this, but it's just titled, Ways to Take Care of Your Soul. Here they are. Look for your guardian angel. Now, get in the habit of looking for your guardian angel. Take long walks, and let your instincts lead the way. That's beautiful. Take long walks and let your instincts lead the way. Wish on falling stars. Sing a song. Buy something new. That does you wonderful good. I just got a new bed in the bag uh, 
made of purples and whites that decorate my bedroom, it did me wonderful good. Buy something new. Rediscover something old. Discovered the other day in my files here a beautiful old candle that I love in, in a, a porcelain uh, rectangular or rather square base. Buy something new. Rediscover something old. Listen carefully to these things. They're simple, wonderful things that can bring light to your life. They're part of the unfolding. Go to bed early. Wake up late. Amen. How good your body feels when you've slept longer than usual. I don't know what it would be in your case, but boy, sometimes it's for me nine or ten hours on those wonderful occasions. And you feel relaxed from the tips of your fingers to the tips of your toes to the top of your head to the soles of your feet. Wake up late. That's a great idea. Wear your favorite jammies to dinner. Now, this is a card God sent to me. Would you like to know the cosmic Christ this way and get a card from the Lord standing in Anna's, Anna's gift shop? You can imagine how much this blessed me. And that very night, I picked up some new candle bases and holders and candles, things that blessed me to carry home, and I came home in an entirely different spirit. Well, here's the advice. Wear your favorite jammies to dinner. Call an old friend. Make a new one. Indulge in simple pleasures of the heart. Amen. Now I'm going to just read this without comment. Ways to take care of your soul. Look for your guardian angel. Take long walks and let your instincts lead the way. Wish on a falling star. Or wish on falling stars. Sing a song. Buy something new. Rediscover something old. Go to bed early and wake up late. Wear your favorite jammies to dinner. Call an old friend. Make a new one. Indulge in simple pleasures of the heart. I made some new friends, and Chris and Adam, I'm sure I'll run into them again at Starbucks, one of my favorite hangouts. And it blessed me. I came home a renewed man. I did not want to go to Starbucks. I was in a fighting mood. I was so mad at God for allowing this infection to return. Those are the, the trials of life that come to us. But you know, out of those trials, Paul said we glory in them. We don't glory in them when we're in them, I'll tell you. It takes a rare bird to do that, and Paul didn't either. He said, I was pressed out of measure above strength, and I was in despair in Second Corinthians uh, chapter 1. But after he got out of them, as I did, then you rejoice in them, because you made the new friends, you picked up the new trinkets, your heart is happy again, joy has filled your soul. That's a great piece of work, that card, ways to take care of your soul. And I pass it on to you. And then God had another card. He said, pick that one up. This is from my heart to your heart also. And these are posted by my living room uh, easy chair where I can be blessed by them. This one in big letters has on the front, things will be better soon. And Emily Matthews is the one who authored this beautiful card. Things will be better soon. And in the inside, she says this, remember, when cares overtake you and you're waiting for skies to clear, that life is a series of changes and a brighter tomorrow is near, that each day is a brand new beginning, each day is a bright new dawn. So when you come to the end of your rope, tie a knot in the end and hang on. Isn't that beautiful? Just puts a lump in my throat. Makes me so happy to read it to you. Remember when cares overtake you and you're waiting for skies to clear, that life is a series of changes and a brighter tomorrow is near, that each day is a brand new beginning, each day is a bright new dawn, aurora consurgence, the rising dawn, what I'm talking about today. So when you come to the end of your rope, tie a knot in the end and hang on. I hope that blesses you like it blessed me so super abundantly. Now, you know what we're talking about here. And I go back to Peter Senge's statement in Synchronicity uh, by Joseph Jaworski. And he says this, The only way to be uncommitted is to lose the realization and fall again into the illusion that we aren't participating in life. You see, God dragged me right back into participation in life last Friday night in my living room and got me out of my chair and over to Starbucks and renewed my sense of 
the implicate order of the hidden patterns. And that was his hidden pattern for that night. I'm not talking about theory. I'm talking about something that's worked hundreds and even thousands of times in my life. And I know many of you can testify in similar fashion in this wonderful extended family. Senge goes on to say this. This discovery leads to the paradoxical integrity of surrender, surrendering into commitment. That's what happened to me at the coffee shop. Now, hear this carefully. I actualize my commitment by listening. And I listen. I actualize my commitment by listening, out of which my doing arises. I fought with God for a while when he said, go to Starbucks, go to Starbucks, go to Starbucks. I said, I don't want to. I'm going to sit in my easy chair and watch television and be mad at you for allowing this to happen. He said, go to Starbucks. And I finally did, and I'm so glad I did. My commitment came and was actualized by listening, out of which my doing, getting out of my chair and getting my rear end in gear and finding myself at Starbucks with Adam and Chris and uh, good evening as twilight deepened into darkness, my doing arose out of that, listening. And he says this, Peter Senge, sometimes the greatest acts of commitment involve doing nothing but sitting and waiting until I just know what to do next. That is such a beautiful line. It confirms exactly what I gave you in, uh, you know, uh, Grandma's bedroom, to sit and count cars. I'm going to repeat Peter Singhi's statement. Sometimes the greatest acts of commitment involve doing nothing but sitting and wait, waiting until I just know what to do next. One more time. The greatest acts of commitment involve doing nothing but sitting and waiting until I just know what to do next. Hear that, my friend. May God make it clear in our hearts. May we be blessed by it. I had a wonderful, lengthy phone conversation the other night from one of my beloved spiritual sons up in central New Hampshire. And we must have talked for an hour, I would guess. But here's a man in the workaday world, middle-aged, that I have known for probably at least 30 years. Yes, certainly, I have known him for that. From early days, many difficulties that he passed through in the days when I was passing through Bible Institute difficulties in northern Vermont. And God has made this man what Jesus called John the Baptist, a bright and shining light. Now, here's an ordinary, everyday fellow like many of us who has to work for a living to keep bread on the table and support his boys and the rest of it. But he told me the most beautiful tales in a voice of total enthusiasm that was utterly infectious even to me over the phone and made me so proud that he had caught the good infection some time ago and he knew what it was to walk with the cosmic Christ and to have the aurora consurgians, the rising dawn, which is another term for resurrection, happen to him time and again through the rough and tumble of life. I cannot think of any better words to summarize the processes which he and I and you and others have passed through than 2 Corinthians 4, 7, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels so that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. We're troubled on every side. Don't expect much more than that in this life. You'll have that quite frequently and regularly. We're troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Knocked down, but not knocked out. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, so that the life of Jesus might be manifested in our mortal bodies. So we which live, like my friend in New Hampshire, my spiritual son there, are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. Christ is seen in you then, just like he was seen in me at Starbucks the other night by Adam and Chris, and they were attracted to the Christ within me. And Paul concludes that great Second Corinthians 4 passage by saying in the 12th verse, so then death works in us, that life may work in others. Carl Jung had a great statement 
We are the Melchizedek priesthood. He didn't say that. I'm saying that. But Carl Jung uh, really knew what he was talking about when he said, unless we can find people who are willing to die a symbolic death, the world faces Holocaust. Unless we can find people like my beloved spiritual son in his middle age up there in central New Hampshire, who are willing to die a symbolic death, the world faces Holocaust. We have a lot of these power cells, like my beloved son in New Hampshire there, who talked with me for an hour on the phone. And I have so many sons and daughters that I have those conversations with from time to time. Even though I'm not a great phone person, the calls come strategically at the right time, and I'm so grateful for that timing, and that we can bless one another so abundantly. And here's a man who was just absolutely filled with ecstasy. Who, and I have a little token of his love right here in my uh, in my den, and I'm turning around to look at it right now, and I call him Blue Feather. And he is a shaman with blue eyes, and he is carved out of wood, and he's holding in his two hands a beautiful blue feather, which is symbolic of the great story and illusions by Richard Bach. If you've never read that all-time best great book. Get it and read it. It is a wonderful, very short, beautiful little fantasy. You cannot afford not to read Illusions by Richard Bach, even if you have to go to the second-hand store to find it these days. In any case, I'd been blessed by this man, and I could sense the enthusiasm and the ecstasy and the euphoria of just living every day in the workaday world. In his relationship with Christ, as he said, exultingly in joy, people seek me out and come to me, sometimes like that fellow that I'm telling you about in New Hampshire, who's just filled with ecstasy. You could hear the joy in his voice when he said, people come to me, they know I've got something. Yes, he has. He has the treasure in his earthen vessel, the indwelling Christ, the cosmic Christ, the living Christ, the one who can speak in your heart. You know, we're a growing number. We're a great, great leavening influence. We're the soul of the earth, the light that is set on a hill that cannot be hit. And uh, the church oftentimes, the institutional church, calls itself lighthouse, and too often, very much too often, it isn't. It's a place where you're paralyzed and taught to live by the dead letter of Scripture, and that you cannot trust your heart. Whereas the whole new covenant says, I have written my law in your mind and I have put it in your heart. And today, if you'll hear his voice, harden not your heart. That's the great Melchizedek book called Hebrews, the epistle of the Hebrews. Saturate yourself in it. Memorize it. When I'm taking my walks in the future, the book I'll be reviewing that I memorized years ago is Hebrews for this year. I'm going to be reviewing that over and over again. And it becomes part of you as the truth of Hebrews, I don't know that he's memorized Hebrews but uh, or any part of it, but in any case, he's practicing it. And that's the important thing, is to walk and listen to the heart, as Peter Senge advises, to sit and listen, to walk and listen. And then you find yourself in that new dimension that David Bohm called the implicate order. And then life is enchanted again. Paul Tillich, complaining about our rationalistic, mechanistic society, Newtonian universe said it's a disenchanted world, and it is. And uh, I could say much about that. And and everything is clanging like it was for me the other day when the realization of this gum infection returned. And the world is out of joint. And the joy is gone. And all the juice is squeezed out of the orange until there's nothing left but a dead green skin. And it's time to re-enchant the world. And when you reconnect, as I did the other night at Starbucks, under God's guidance. And who told me that? I didn't read the scriptures. It was the living Christ who told me. There is a time to get saturated in scriptures. And my messages are saturated with it. But for God's sake and for your sake, don't live by the dead letter. Live by the Spirit. If we live in the Spirit, Galatians 5, Paul says, let us also walk in the Spirit. About the last verse in that chapter. You'll find your world re-enchanted. For example, this morning, I went down, uh, out on my balcony here, where you know I love to sit. I haven't got it all set up for summer yet, because I'm not sure the rainy season's over. 
But I have my folding chair out there, and it's such a beautiful place to sit, especially in the early morning before the sun comes up over it. And, and I don't have all my shade yet either because the leaves are just young and tender and new. And you can see right through the trees, whereas a little later on you won't be able to do that. But I went out in my wonderful spot, my balcony. It's a place where I meet the birds and meet God, and sure enough, there was my dove friend over on the same tree, on the same branch that I told you so many humorous stories about last year. I think she's spying out the land, maybe the same dove, because she was on the same branch in the same tree, ready to build her spring nest when the time comes, which is not quite yet, I guess. And uh, looking over at me from time to time, and I'd talk to her. Try talking to the birds when you're on your walk. They'll lock you up maybe, but so what? You can be a bright and shining light in the institution. But in any case, learn to talk to nature. I went out and sat down in my chair with a favorite cup of coffee, you know, uh, uh, French vanilla this morning. And uh, as soon as I was sitting down in my chair and thinking about doing this tape today, a raven flew over and called me three times. Now, three is the number of a higher synthesis. I had an enchanted world immediately. God was immediately speaking to me from the implicate order and saying, yes, do it today. I've been waiting quite a while. As you know, I've kept you waiting quite a while for this tape. But here I am. And you know, uh, a raven is uh, the uh, bird who can teach you to uh, uh, shapeshift. And uh, I hope you learn that. Just a minute, I have to look this up in uh, uh, Animal Speaks and give you a good line. Now, Animal Speaks, of course, is one of the books that will again be on my book list by Ted Andrews. And you'll pick up the enchantment of this. Learn to pay attention to the birds and do all things in nature. Uh, God speaking, as I said in the last tape, uh, in the rustling grass even. And he says this. Uh, the raven, uh, his keynote is magic, shape-shifting, and creation. He's a bird of mysticism and magic. And uh, goes on to say this uh, on page uh, 188. Each of us has a magician with him. That's what I've been telling you about that dear uh, son of mine up there in New Hampshire. You have a Merlin within you. You have a magician within you. Each of us, Ted Andrews says, has a magician within, and it is a raven that can show us how to bring that part out of the dark and into the light. Raven speaks of messages from the spirit realm that can shape-shift your life dramatically. Now, if God sent ravens to take care of Elijah in the Old Testament in the days of Yahweh, don't you think that the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ can send a raven over your balcony to speak to you and to confirm this is the day to do it? And he called me three times. He just flew straight overhead and called me three times. Now, when I stepped out in that same balcony a week or ten days ago, there were three red-tailed hawks circling above me, and I had not looked straight up. And I mean, this was straight over my balcony. And I heard the eagle scream. And I thought, can there be an eagle down here in the desert? And uh, I uh, was uh, disoriented for a few minutes, wondering where an eagle could be in the, right down here in the city of Bakersfield in the Kern County Desert. And it screamed again, and I looked up, and uh, another magnificent scream, and here it is not an eagle, three red-tailed hawks, who, incidentally, that happens to be Nancy's totem. But I looked it up in my uh, Animal Speaks book here, and it says, be alert, there's a message coming. Well, here's the message. Aurora Consurgians, the Rising Dawn. And I'm sharing it with you today. And that was a week to ten days ago. And the raven said this morning, now's the time, and he calls three times, and three is synthesis on a higher level. On the third day, he rose again, Aurora Consurgians, the rising dawn. All nature speaks, the songwriter says. All nature sings, and round me rings the music of the spheres. For God's sake, my dear friends, get into it. Head over heels, totally abandon yourself to it, to the robust and wonderful rough-and-tumble life of sitting in your living room chair madder than hell the other night and saying, I ain't going to Starbucks, no way, man, and finally ending up there and finding your world re-enchanted. Be ready to wrestle with God. As I said in the last series in that uh, tape on Jacob, fight like hell till dawn. 
and all of a sudden you burst forth into the bright sunlight of a brand new dawn and a bright new day. This is it. And God bless you. We have come to resurrection time. Hallelujah. Now, who are these strange ducks that are out there running around re-enchanting the world? Uh, just all kinds of good people, like my spiritual son up there in New Hampshire. And right now I have in my book, hand rather, in my hand book, as I frequently do, uh, with a subtitle, Hidden Dimensions of Christianity. And the book's main title is Thea Sophia which means The Theology of Sophia, the Wisdom of God, written by Arthur Verslis. V Vers Lewis, I guess it is, V-E-R-S-L-U-I-S. -S. Now, this is a heavy book, and I don't recommend this to everybody, and it, pr it probably may not even be on my book list. You listen to the Spirit of God. When you go shopping books, and I'll just mention this to you now, don't buy everything in sight, and when I send you a book list this year, my dear friend that I heard about last year went out and bought every book, book on the list and then never read them all, of course. I do that. I buy books that I don't read at times, and people hand me books that uh, the Spirit doesn't lead me to read for a long time, if ever. But in any case, you can spend, uh, save yourself some money by asking the Spirit, give me a green light on this. If this thing's from you, I'll tell you, God is not tongue-tied. And when he wants you to go to Starbucks, he can tell you, go to Starbucks, just like I can tell you that. Well, the same thing with books. No, that isn't for you or a caution light. Wait a while. Wait a little while. Then honor the caution light and wait a little while. No, that book isn't for you. That's a red light. Don't pick it up. And I'm saying to you, don't get this book unless the Spirit of God tells you to because it's more advanced and more mystical. Well, we've got a bunch of fledgling mystics in varying stages of de development running around out there in our extended family, re-enchanting the world. God bless you. I love you. Keep it up. And listen to the Christ within. And read Matt Fox's book on the coming cosmic Christ. Keep up this good stuff. And you're going to get a great bibliography this year. And thanks for bearing with me and being patient with me. I appreciate it. Because I couldn't have done anything else but what I'm doing. Now this book, for example, was handed to me by one of my other wonderful spiritual sons, David Scalzio. And Oz Oshevsky, and uh, I, I think I'm pronouncing their last names right. I know them as David and Oz, Dave and Oz. And by the way, Dave and Oz, uh, we had some great times on my fall itinerary, and you seem to have been wafted to the desert. I don't know that God has you guys out there in a cave somewhere or what, but I haven't heard from you recently. So if you're listening to this tape, <laughs> here's a personal message. And that goes for some of the rest of you. I'd love to hear from you. So here's this good book, and it says this. What kind of people have we got running around out there, these little merlins that are re-enchanting the world? So I'm reading from page 156 in Theosophia. Uh, to realize Sophia is to realize a state of revelation and divine vision opened in the soul. I want to read that again. Let it sink in now. I'll read it slowly. To realize Sophia, this is the female side of God, the feminine side of God, wisdom, as she, call, as she is called in Proverbs in the wisdom literature. She was with God in the foundation of the world. She's the feminine side of God. To realize, in other words, to come to know, to have her manifested, Sophia, and to have her in your life is to realize a state of revelation. Now, like my son up there in New Hampshire, people know that I've got something and they're magnetically and miraculously drawn to me and I help people and he found great joy in the fact that he had something to give them of the treasure that he had within that's what this person is talking about Verslius when he says to realize Sophia is to realize a state of revelation you know you walk with God a long time and uh, or a shorter time whatever the case may be and you then practice that verse that Paul gave which I used to give countless invitations on in great public meetings, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, this is a request from God to you, my friend, today, if you haven't done it, to present your body a living sacrifice. Now, God can't do that for you, and no one else can do it for you. Are you willing to give God everything you are and have or ever hope to be? To wholly, absolutely, unreservedly commit yourself and your body to God, and say, this is your temple, and I give it back to you, 
and you are my raison d'etre, most blessed Lord, and I live for your glory alone. And I will obey you to the best of my ability and walk with you. To that end, I commit myself wholly to you. I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, Romans 12, 1, that you present your body once for all, is what it says in the Greek, a living sacrifice. Once you've done it, and then it, you don't ever have to present it again. God takes you and he puts an invisible mark on you. And then you won't be conformed to this world and its system. You won't be living in the dead letter anymore. You'll get radical messages from God in varying degrees of intensity. I uh, Be not conformed to this world and to the system. Don't be locked up in a disenchanted system. Be not conformed to this world, but be in a constant state of transformation by the renewing of your mind and proving God's good and acceptable and perfect will for you. That's what my friend in New Hampshire is doing. That's what my friend Dave does. That's what my friend Oz does. They're happy in the Lord, in the living Christ, the cosmic Christ. Many dear daughters uh, uh, that have sent me so much beautiful stuff, you know, uh, are in that uh, group. I'm not going to take time to mention them today, but here are some sons that I've mentioned to you. And this book came to my hand from them. To realize Sophia is to re realize a state of revelation. You start living in a state of revelation. You can hear God morning, noon, and night, and in the night. And divine vision opened in the soul. You start getting gentle impressions from God, visions and dreams. And you start getting guided out of the implicate order. You start getting your patterns from there. That's why I read Jaworski to you this morning. The best thing to do is to sit down and just listen until you know what to do next. But listen to this line. I want to reread it because this is a vitally important line and I'm going to read it slowly. To realize Sophia is to realize or experience, if I may paraphrase, a state of revelation and divine vision opened in the soul. Prerequisite to anyone becoming a member of the everlasting priesthood of Melchizedek. I read it again to you. To realize or experience Sophia is to experience a state of revelation and divine vision opened in the soul. In other words, you don't just do it sporadically. Increasingly, you live in that state. Like my friend in New Hampshire, like so many other sons and daughters and uh, beloved friends. You live in that state so that you hear God. You pick up the currents. I'm proud of my blood sons who walk in that kind of walk with God and listen to what their dreams and what the messages that God sends to them mean. It becomes a state of revelation in your soul. And it's prerequisite to your becoming a member of the everlasting order of Melchizedek. Most Christians don't have an idea in the world what Melchizedek is about. And I bring him into series after series because it is the cutting edge of this new 21st century. And through the days to come, it will be the cutting edge. God wants you in the priesthood of Melchizedek. But you have to mature to a point where you can present your body a living sacrifice and then start walking with the cosmic Christ and let God let the uh, take the old dead leaves of legalism and fundamentalism off you and to fall off like it were early winter until you stand through your barren season and come forth in aurora consurgians clothed in bright new green, hata, pavanas, colors everywhere, spring is here, the tail of the peacock, the bright colors and evidence as they are at this time of year. Listen to that line again if you have to run the tape back, but listen to it until it sinks in. Let the old dead leaves fall away. Go through your barren winter seasons, but you will come out into aurora consurgians, the rising dawn of resurrection. Hallelujah. May God seal that to our soul. And that to have to establish, to be able to hear God's voice, will put you in a state of revelation so that you're able to receive re revelation from God. Watchman Nee talked about that. He was an early Christian pioneer to talk to the present church about it in his great books, The Normal Christian Life and The Normal Christian Church Life, and changed into his likeness. I'm sorry that I lost my copies of those books and my many moves, uh, phys physically moving from one place to another. But Watchman Nee is a great writer on that. And uh, you'll be blessed by it. And of course, Pastor Joe, the Korean Christian, in his books on the fourth dimension is just outstanding in this. 
In any case, learning to receive revelation is prerequisite to becoming a member of the everlasting priesthood of Melchizedek. And uh, my friend up there in New Hampshire has used that term. He knows he's a Melchizedek priest, and indeed he is. Now, dear friends, take heart in this and be blessed by it. We've got a whole bunch of Melchizedek whirling characters running around out there spreading the good infection, as C.S. Lewis once put it, uh, just by the joy and enthusiasm and the light in their face that the inner light cannot be hit. Christ cannot be hit. He comes out in your countenance, just like Adam and Chris could not resist striking up a conversation with me the other night. So you'll be blessed, and the world will be enchanted again. Hallelujah. And I pause for a moment to grab something else. Uh, but before I grab something else, that's what I love about these fireside chats. I can stop a minute and grab something the Spirit of God tells me to take off the shelf on the other side of the room. But there's more to be read right here before I do that. And he goes on to say this, uh, Virgilius, Arthur uh, Virgilius in Sophia, Theosophia. The birth of wisdom in the soul. That's when, uh, that's, that's a wonderful birth of Christ's image in you, the golden child. That's what Paul prayed, my little children, of whom I'm in birth pangs again, till Christ be formed in you. I see I'm going to have to watch my tape here because I do want to leave uh, room for Nancy, but we can do that easily enough. I'm glad the Lord reminded me because I'm waxing uh, warm to my theme here. Wesley says this, the birth of wisdom in the soul opens therein the secrets of the invisible world and the soul becoming as a clear unspotted mirror uh, to receive their reflections. When you open your soul and present your body a living sacrifice, and tell God you're opening your heart. You want it to be his temple, her temple. It's both, you know, he and she. And then the birth of wisdom takes place in your soul. Sophia is born in your heart. That's the golden child and opens therein the secrets of the invisible world. Well, in other words, like Paul says, while well, we look not at the things which are seen, uh, but at the things which are not seen. Um, and he says, for our late affliction, down here in three dimensions, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Our late afflictions, including infections in your gum, like I told you about earlier, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding eternal weight of glory. I'm speaking here out of experience, present current experience. While we look not at the things which are seen, Use your spiritual eyes. Use the eyes and ears of your heart to gaze into the implicate order. While we look not at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen, you have dove's eyes, my friend. You have eagle's eyes to look into other dimensions and see different and better than you ever have before. That's why God gives us these tokens. While we look not at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are only for time and space, and the things which are not seen are eternal. Hallelujah. That's what he's talking about. Virgilius, as he writes, the birth of wisdom in the soul opens therein the secrets of the invisible worlds. The soul becoming as a clear, unspotted mirror. Remember 2 Corinthians 3.18? Your soul become what 2 Corinthians 3 talks about and Virgilius talks about? A clear, unspotted mirror to receive the reflections that come from eternity. We all, with unveiled face, beholding as a mirror the glory of the Lord, are gradually metamorphosed into his image from glory to glory to glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. And verse Arthur goes on to say, the birth of wisdom, or the virgin mother in the soul, precedes the birth of power. Hear that? The birth of wisdom precedes the birth of power, or the Logos Christ. First, Mary is born in your soul, so to speak, and then Christ is born in you. Paul said, my little children, of whom I am in birth pangs again, till Christ be formed in you. Those were the Galatians he was praying for in 419 of that great epistle. He had led them to Christ, but 10, 15 years after, 10 to 13 years later, he was so disappointed in them because they were dead letter Christians stuck in the letter of the word stuck in the traditions, then developing of the New Testament, stuck in legalism. That's exactly what they were stuck in, okay? 
he said, oh, having begun in the spirit, are you now being made perfect by the flesh? And uh, so he's praying for them. My little children, I'm in birth pangs again till Christ be formed in you. Yes. Now that's what I'm talking about here. And uh, my sons and daughters, like the one in New Hampshire, have had Christ formed in them. And the birth of wisdom comes first, and then the birth of power, the Logos, Christ. Verselius goes on to say, one first opens up one's spiritual eyes, becoming receptive to spiritual truth, and then come, becomes active oneself. Hear this, I've got it in purple in this book. I've got the tail of the peacock in my book here, colored up with purples and greens and yellows, all of which means something special to me, and blues. And I've got this underlined in royal purple. That means priestly truth, Melchizedek truth. One first opens up, one spiritual eyes becoming receptive to spiritual truth, and then becomes active oneself as a member of the everlasting, timeless order of Melchizedek. Hear that. If you open yourself up as I've described today, and you wholly put your heart in the hand of the living cosmic Christ, if you start living out of the implicate order, then you've opened your spiritual eyes, you become receptive to spiritual truth, and you become active as a member of the everlasting, timeless order of Melchizedek. Are you, my friend, today a Melchizedek priest? Are you a Melchizedek priest today? Have you opened yourself up in the fashion that I've described in this first tape on the rising dawn? Is the dawn rising in you? Are you experiencing a manifestation of resurrection life? Always bearing about your body the dying of the Lord Jesus so that the life of Jesus can be manifested in your mortal body three-dimensionally. Something comes out of the implicate order, the power and wisdom of Christ, born in both feminine and masculinity in your inner being, and you become a little Christ. You become a walking Christ. You become a Melchizedek priest. Okay, we've got to draw the string. Listen carefully now. I mentioned earlier, and I have it before me, from page 111 of New Image by Edinger, where he quotes Jung's great words. We are threatened with universal genocide if we cannot work out the way of salvation by a symbolic death. Do you know what Carl Jung, who is such a great saint and prophet in his own right, a modern Isaiah, is telling us here, he's telling us that we need to be Melchizedek priests, that the world in its continuation depends upon people who are the salt of the earth and power cells like you and me, like my friend there in New Hampshire, like so many of you. We are threatened, Carl Jung says, with universal genocide if we cannot work out the way of salvation by a symbolic death. You are extremely important. It is important that you yield yourself to God. He has a special mission, a plan, and a place for you. He wants to plant you like he has my beloved son in central New Hampshire. He's planted me here in Bakersfield to help preserve the city of L.A. from destruction as uh, a very dear uh, favorite son and friend spoke to me so magnificently when I first came here and needed to know the mind of God. And we power cells are helping hold back as the soul of the earth, the corruption, and to send out the radiance of the implicate order, to send out resurrection waves, resurrection life, aurora consurgians, to bring the dawn to the darkness, to bring the light. And you know, John 1 5 was my life, uh, or rather my years verse last year. The light shines in darkness, and the darkness has never been able to overcome it. It is essential that you let your light so shine before men that they may see your unique good works. Not prescribed in the book someplace. Not go to church on Sunday. Not fail uh, to tithe. It's what God's telling you in your deep heart if you can hear that message, which is what I've been talking about, the hearing heart here. And if you can hear that, then you'll radiate out what you are as a power cell You'll be giving the rays of the early dawn 
into the darkness, and you'll be overcoming the darkness, and you'll be what's known in the New Testament as an overcomer. And you know there are all kinds of promises. Read Revelation chapters 2 and 3. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I overcame and am set down with my Father in his throne. This is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. That's what I'm talking about. Jung says we are threatened with universal genocide if we cannot work out the way of salvation by a symbolic death. Are you willing to die that symbolic death that I've been talking about daily to take up your cross and follow the cosmic Christ within? Are you in a state of revelation where you can receive the raven's message this morning, the message from three red-tailed hawks about seven to ten days ago? Are you there where God can speak to you in the rustling grass? If you are, then you are one of God's power cells, called a Melchizedek priest. You're one of his little magicians. You're one of those magic people that I've been talking about. He'll take you to a card shop and hand you a couple magnificent messages like I shared with you earlier on this tape. The other night I was sitting and uh, watching my one of my favorite channels, Discovery Channel, that and Learning Channel, I find myself watching frequently with their varied and interesting uh, programming agenda. And this one happened to be on uh, Doomsday Prophecies. I think it was a two-hour program, and I didn't watch it that long, but a man that I cannot recall his real name, but he used to be on the old series called The Man from Uncle, and I think his name on that series, his act, actor's uh, name, in other words, when he was called in A Man from Uncle, was Mr. Cory Ockin. And he's kind of a mystical uh, type of guy, and he's the perfect man to narrate Doomsday Prophecies, you know, like Nostradamus and all that kind of thing, including the prophecies from Santa Maria, California, that came through a very common, ordinary uh, lady who said we need to turn back to God or Holocaust is at the doors. All kinds of frightening messages. And another fellow who was uh, from, uh, he was, I think, from the Caucasus region of Russia, who was actually uh, seized by God in the trance and given some last-day prophecies that man better turn back to God or there's going to be hell to pay. Well, you know, the book of the Revelation and many fundies, and I used to do it in the great prophetic conferences when I was a fundamentalist, preach on apocalyptic prophecies in the book of the Revelation and uh, some other uh, sources in the Bible. And I said to God while I was sitting there watching all these prophecies, doomsday prophecies, where does this fit in vis-a-vis -vis my place in the universe to which you have honed me in a very refined process over the past several years? And the Lord answered the question very simply and very quickly. Unless we have people like you and your friends who are willing to be power cells and Melchizedek priest, then these plagues, this holocaust, this apocalypse will come on mankind. But if we can find men who are willing to stand in the gap and make up the hedge, these apocalyptic happenings will not come on mankind. And I'd like to commit that to you to ponder at the close of this tape. And I do have to restrain myself and give Nancy a little bit of room here. So I close with this. We are threatened with universal genocide. I want to tell you that we need to learn how to die a symbolic death. I have been crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. You know, those wonderful passages always bearing about the body, the dying of the Lord Jesus. And when I get back to you in the next tape, I want to show you where Melchizedek, one of the first places he appeared in the Old Testament. He doesn't appear very much. You know, he's a very mystical figure. But he appears out of the womb of the morning in Psalm 110. And before we get together again and I talk about the morning star and Melchizedek out of the womb of the morning, I suggest that you use every version you've got available to read Psalm 110. And we'll be looking forward to another great time together when we gather around the word uh, at that time in our next tape number two. I have really enjoyed this so much, this fireside chat. And the next one will be another fireside chat. God bless you, my dear friends. And stay tuned. Nancy has some things she wants to share with you. God bless you and God bless you, Nancy, as you 
uh, share with this wonderful family. Amen. Well, I'm quite sure you probably would have preferred to have listened to Bruce a little bit longer, but at least I can tell you this, that um, by not finishing this tape uh, and allowing some time for me, he is in the process right now of recording yet another tape, a continuance of this wonderful one that you just heard. And uh, hopefully you'll have that very shortly. We'll probably get these tapes out pretty much back to back and get caught up a little bit on the tapes this year. Everybody's been very patient. And I, we surely appreciate that. Uh, I wanted to visit just a minute to let you know about what we're doing with the website, what you might expect from it. We're certainly open to any and all suggestions that people might have. Uh, our goal at this time is to make it a place where we can revitalize and revive a lot of Bruce's older works that are just pure gems. They're just absolutely diamonds that are very much needed at this time and place in Christian walks for many people. Uh, most of you who have been with us many, many years know that it's a little, sometimes a little difficult to have someone jump just right in the middle of where Bruce is teaching on the very cutting edge of what he sees. Um, he can't go back and reteach the old. It's not like you can repaint the picture or anything else. But we have his work on tape, and we can certainly make it available. And now with using the Internet, um, we can put the tapes on there. We can also take and produce the old tapes in written form. That's always been something that we've been looking forward to. And I think it'll be a time when time and a place where you can go back in and and go and resample some of the old stuff. Uh, you can introduce it to a new friend. We the kinds of things that can be done on a website are only limited to what we want to think. And I really feel very strongly that this is a way for Bruce to be uh, continuing in ministry in a way that. It makes it easy for him. I mean, he needs he needs his alone times. He needs his um, moving at a pace that is him. And this way, we can take uh, the years and years and tapes. I mean, you guys don't even know how many boxes of tapes there are, which also brings me up to another subject of, of getting old tapes back out for you. But he, Bruce had had a dream, and to quickly paraphrase it, and that's why right now I wish he was sitting right here that I could have him tell it. But he had had a dream where he saw everyone was hearing his work um, at their own pace, and he, he couldn't interfere with it at all. And the two of us talked about it, and we felt very much, yes, that's how the website would be, you know, not knowing who was on at any given time and listening to his works or downloading written works or whatever they would be getting from his site. Uh, the site has not progressed quite as quickly as I would like. It's definitely developing steady by jerks, as Bruce would say, to quote his father. But um, And I won't go into all the whys for that, but we'll get there little by little. And um, I, as I said, I'd appreciate any input, anything you would personally like to see. And if it's something that we feel would incorporate appropriately, we'll certainly make it a part. As I mentioned, we will be bringing back the old tapes. They will be appropriately cataloged, um, maybe edited, whatever they need. I now have a, a decent double deck that I can do some editing work with. Uh, as they become available and I get things unpacked and organized in a way that I can get my hands on things, those of you who have requested older tapes, be sure to get back in touch with me and we'll start to make those things available to you. Before Bruce and I were ever married, he always felt that I would be the one to be able to handle um, his old journals, handle his work and everything. And I kind of look at now we've entered a place where that, that's becoming a reality. And um, we have such a wonderful relationship that it's working very, very well. I've made a lot of changes within my own working conditions, but within real estate, I've brought my office um, 
home, which is giving me some space to be able to use computers, do additional work, um, and, and get some of this um, ministry work out again. So that's why some of this is being able to happen. Uh, as I said, I'll have to do a lot of unpacking, a lot of finding old well tapes, but uh, we'll get them out to you. I'd like to just thank those of you that when you write, you say hi to me. I, I enjoy hearing from you, um, and I'm trying to get better at keeping up with my own mail. And um, anyone who has email, please go ahead and, and give us your email address. I'm not quite sure all of what we'll be doing with that, but again, that's something that will develop. Um, if you ever have any questions, I, I like to feel that I'm, I'm available if you want to call. The best number to reach me at these days in, in during the day is at area code 307-527-5757. That's my home office. And I'm here. And if I tell you I'm busy, I, I'll be real honest with you. But if you ever want to call, I love hearing from everybody. And I want to thank you for the time. It's been nice visiting with you. Um, the kids are doing good, and Dan and completes his second year in college and has reached a, one of those crisis stages for himself. Uh, he doesn't know what he wants to do, so he's going to take a little time off. Um, I'm not real concerned about the kid. He's one of these that I know at some point he'll pull himself together and know which direction he wants to take. Uh, Ryan is doing really terrific. Uh, I'm doing good. Business has picked up. And... Um, Again, thanks for giving me a minute to talk to you all and uh, look forward to getting more tapes out. And as I said, let me know if there's anything uh, I can particularly do for you. Um, I enjoy hearing from everyone. God bless you all. See you soon.